Welcome to the Accelerator Info Day on aerosol and surface decontamination for pandemic management of the European Innovation Council. My name is Annemarie Sassen. I'm the head of unit of the Program Manager's Office. And I'm today with Enrique Claverol, our Program Managers on Medical Technologies, who will explain you everything about this uh, Accelerator Challenge. This meeting is recorded and we will make uh, the recording and the slides of this event available uh, on the same page as where you now have connected to this event. So that you can also refer to it later when you are writing your proposal and uh, when new questions uh, appear to you at that stage. So today you have the opportunity to ask all questions about this topic to Enrique. And uh, in order to do that, Please submit your questions to Slido. So slide.do and then use the event code, event code challenges and then there you can put all the questions that you have. Um, can we please go to the next slide? Enrique, I think you were sh sharing the slides now. Yes, so as said, we are uh, discussing this afternoon the aerosol decontamination accelerator challenge. Can we please go to the next one? And yes, I first want to explain uh, the agenda to you. Um, I will start with a short introduction about the European Innovation Council and its instruments. And there I also want to explain uh, the proactive management that we have in the European Innovation Council. And after that, Enrique Claverol will start with uh, explaining the, um, the challenge aerosol and surface decontamination for pandemic management. Um, he will talk around 13 minutes about that. And after that, there will be time to answer your questions. Uh, so please provide your, your questions in the Slido, as I said before. Then we will have some closing remarks and it's expected that around uh, 3.30 we will finish this session. So next slide, please. So the European Innovation Council is part of Horizon Europe. You know, Horizon Europe is a very large, uh, around 95 billion euro research program. And around 10% of that, 10 billion euro, is dedicated to the European Innovation Council. And the European Innovation Council is placed in pillar three, innovative Europe, to um, distinguish its features that it has to, to bring uh, groundbreaking research as soon as possible to the market. You see that um, also in other parts of Horizon Europe, there is uh, research and innovation related to uh, medical technologies. For instance, in pillar two, uh, there is the cluster on health, where also a lot of uh, collaborative research on medical technologies is done. But in my next slide, I will explain the differences with how we uh, go about that in the European Innovation Council. Can we go please to the next slide? So in the EIC, uh, we want to bring research as soon as possible to the market, as I said, and we have three instruments for that. The first one is Pathfinder, which focuses on low technology readiness levels research, which is um, potentially uh, groundbreaking, but also still uh, very risky. And uh, there we want that uh, consortia, they uh, develop uh, based on their uh, research, a proof of concept that uh, the idea could in principle work. So they bring research from TRL level two to TRL level four, and they will receive a grant up to three to four million euro. So the next instrument, it's transition. So if the Pathfinder uh, delivered a good uh, proof of concept, but it would still need more maturation, uh, it would still need more uh, 
market uh, validation and market readiness, then you can apply for transition. And transition, you would move your, um, your technology from TRL level four to TRL level six. And there you also receive a grant and this can be up to two and a half million euro. And then our third instrument, that is accelerator and that is for high TRL. So from TRL six to TRL nine, it is for individual SMEs. And uh, the idea is there that you can develop and scale up the disruptive innovations that, that have been developed by startups and SMEs. And here, the, the financial instrument is uh, blended finance. There could be a grant part up to two and a half million euro, but also an equity part. And that can go up to 15 million euro or above. So the ticket size of Accelerator is much larger and that is needed to really scale up the innovations of an SME and to overcome the, the value of death. Can we go to the next slide? So the EIC wants to uh, help all the beneficiaries during their entrepreneurial journey. And on this slide, we see again the three instruments, Pathfinder, Transition and Accelerator. I already explained in the previous slide that their technology readiness level is, is going up with every of these three instruments, but also their commercial readiness goes up. So in Pathfinder, the commercial uh, outlook is still needs to be developed, but when once it is accelerator, then that, that should be ready. And in a way, the EIC uh, accompanies the, the beneficiaries from research to commercial, whereas in the research side, the question to be answered is, what is the technology? What can the technology do for me? Uh, whereas in the commercial side, the main question is why, and then it is, why would customers buy my products? And what can the customers usually do with my products? Which problems does it solve that customers really have? So if we go to the next slide. So the EIC has these three instruments. Um, but it doesn't give only financial support. It also provides um, other services which are uh, of the benefit to the beneficiaries. And these are called uh, business acceleration services. And uh, for instance, uh, some of the services uh, which uh, we give, they are listed on the left hand side of the slide, uh, access to entrepreneurs. So the business acceleration services organizes uh, pitching events with relevant investors for groups of uh, uh, beneficiaries of, of the EIC. Um, you can have a mentor helping you. Uh, you can have access to ecosystems. For instance, uh, one of the activities is that we organize corporate days where, where a corporate, uh, maybe in your domain, um, is interested to meet the, the beneficiaries in, in that domain. And then we would organize a day at the headquarters of this corporate where the SMEs can then pitch for the corporate in the hope that a sustainable relationship will be established after this day. So there are many business advisory services, but what we also have in the, in the EIC, and this is also unique to Horizon uh, Europe, are the program managers. So we have 10 program managers. They are experts which are hired temporarily by the European Commission. So they are with us for four years. Uh, they are uh, in their domain. They have uh, done the, the deep tech research that is also required by the EIC. But they've also be, uh, bring, been bringing it to the market, bringing it to uh, commercial um, application of, of their research. So they have a very uh, unique profile and they are supporting the projects also in their journey. And um, what the, the program managers do is actually two things. One is that they develop a vision. 
Um, and this vision is then based on an area where Europe already has uh, good research developed and maybe has patents or, or other assets, but there are not yet enough innovative companies in that area. So they develop, uh, they based on their strategic intelligence, they identify those areas and these then translate into the challenges that we have in the work program of the EIC. And then the second task that they that they have, it's uh, portfolio management. There they work with groups of projects in their domain and then they, they support them uh, with uh, overcoming all the barriers that, that companies have in that area to really um, go to the market. If we go to the next slide. In this slide, you can see an overview of the whole 2023 work program of the EIC. So we have uh, the total budget is around 1.6 billion euro. And you can see in the left hand side of the slide that this is divided over three instruments, uh, Pathfinder, Transition and Accelerator. You see that the bulk of the money goes to Accelerator, so to the individual uh, SMEs. And each of, the, of these instruments, they have an open part where you can submit any on any topic uh, proposal as long for instance for pathfinder it is early research and for accelerator it is already uh, for a developed uh, product um, and the other half of of the three instruments it's dedicated to challenges eh? these challenges which are associated with the visions of the program managers so today in this session we will now look at the uh, accelerator topic. You can see it on the right hand side underlined aerosol and surface decontamination. And then uh, at uh, in one and a half hour, we will have the transition topic medical micro nano bio de devices, which is also developed by uh, the program man manager Enrique Claverol. So in this list, you can also see all the other challenges that we have. And we are organizing this week and also next week info days about each of these uh, challenges with the dedicated program managers. Can we go to the next one? So um, this slide is just to give you an overview of the of the deadlines to apply. We call it cutoff dates quite often you there is a continuous submission scheme with, with cutoff dates. And uh, now we are in the accelerator topic. And you can see that there are still three uh, dates for which uh, you can uh, submit your proposal. 22nd of March, 7th of June, and the 4th of October. And this, the date for open accelerator and the challenge accelerator are the same dates. The next slide, please. So uh, in this session, we will uh, concentrate on the topic of uh, aerosol and surface decontamination. And we will not uh, go into too much detail on uh, exactly how to submit your proposal. That has already been set on a general info day on the 13th of December. And if you need that type of information, then you could watch the recording of the day where everything will be explained. And here you also see the link to the EIC work program 2023, which is our Bible as regards uh, what is in scope of a certain challenge or not. So with this, I want to hand over to Enrique, who will now explain you everything about uh, the aerosol and surface decontamination topic. Enrique, go ahead. Thanks so much. Marie. I'm not sure I will discuss everything, but I'll try to discuss a, a few useful things, hopefully. Uh, first thing I want to do is um, thank uh, my colleagues, um, Justina Tisseran, Giovanni La Placa, and Neil Griffin, because they are present. Um, Justina Tisseran is an expert in the monitoring part. So during the execution of the projects, after you sign the contract and the project starts, 
whereas um, Giovanni and Neil are experts in the evaluation part. So um, typically I will defer to them the questions that are very operational because they are the experts about this. It is a complicated engine and they are very, very experienced for many years and they are the best to answer the questions about those specific aspects of so evaluation and, and monitoring. Um, first things first, um, I'm a program manager, so um, I can bring to the commission my thoughts about the market, the technologies, um, and so a brief disclaimer, uh, the views I express about the market, the technology, the trends, what I see happening next, these are my views. These, these do not represent policy of the commission. This is probably not a core topic today because I will be just describing the, the cold text and there's really no space for new ideas, but just, just for you to know a brief disclaimer. So the first thing I plan to do is, uh, Anne-Marie already explained a little bit the pipeline that we have a structure. Maybe I want to give you a bit of background again about that pipeline of funding, but in, from the context of somebody who might want to submit a proposal to us so that it guides you um, to design that proposal to have more opportunities uh, to be successful. So first key concept, remember that the agency um, was created. Let me turn on the, the pointer, it might be easier. Um, remember that the agency, the EEC was created to bring science to market. So that's a critical thing. That's a, that's a critical KPR for us. So your projects are instrumental for the agency to bring products to market. That is critical. Um, and we seek to create a pipeline of technology projects that have relatively high probability of reaching the end user. Uh, we understand risk, we support risk, but we have to get to the user within the time span of the execution of the projects. And of course, we support deep, deep tech. So not all projects make sense for us as a public organization using public funding. We take the risk that the private sector could not take, and that's our space. This is the gap that we try to fill. So all the proposals you submit to us, it should be clear that they, they are deep tech. In general, that will mean there's a lot of technology and some risk associated to the technology. Again, as Almari described, we have three, we have structure the funding pipeline in three stages, Pathfinder, Transition and Accelerator. The main topic of the discussion today is Accelerator, but I just want to relate Accelerator to Pathfinder and Transition, so you, you have a vision of the context. Uh, by the way, to my, my colleagues, uh, Justina, Giovanni, Neil, do not hesitate to uh, come in at any point. If there is something in the slides you want to, uh, you know, make a comment on, do not hesitate. Uh, so the Pathfinder, for the audience, please remember that Pathfinder is where we ask researchers to create new technologies. This is kind of the core engine of invention of our pipeline. So the future product, the core novelty, the core technological novelty is invented in Pathfinder. But always those Pathfinder projects should have a final user in mind, but they do a lot of research. And the risk, the technological research in Pathfinder, we understand, will be very high. But this is Pathfinder, and we're not talking about uh, Pathfinder today. Our main focus is Accelerator. Now, when those medical technology projects in Pathfinder finalize successfully, and that usually means for us, for me in MedTech, that means a proof of concept device. And typically, this could be sort of a hand wired PCB board some kind of implantable device, for example, tested with rodents uh, or even in vitro, anything that proves that the functionality of the core tech is the core technology is there and something that allows us all to anticipate the safety factor might be there in the future when the final develop, the final product is developed. If that's achieved, we consider that a successful Pathfinder project and that's your proof of concept in the context of MedTech. We, of course, talking about medical technologies. Then we realize that usually the private sector is not ready to support with private funding that stage, the next stage. So when you end up with a proof of concept in Pathfinder, usually you will not find investors. There are exceptions, of course, that's fantastic, but typically you will not find private investors who look at that hand-wired or hand-soldered PCB board and some data and a few papers and a few patents and then go in and, and do a first round 
of you know early stage or seed or even pre pre seed. Typically, you know the private sector tends to be risk averse and it's difficult to get support at that stage. So we recognize that situation and we create this transition. Let's call it an additional bridge funding or a bridge check that the project can get. So when the POC is achieved in Pathfinder, you can go into transition. We provide 2.5 million is a grant. So the same thing as in Pathfinder, it's a grant. Pathfinder is a larger uh, funding um, segment. It's four to five million, but this is 2.5 million. It's a grant. When you finalize transition, then we assume the transition was refining the device. Typical example in medtech, going into medical grade materials or getting some, perhaps some clinical data, or maybe just completing the preclinical work. But at the end of transition, projects should be ready for accelerator. So accelerator is, is a topic today. So what's coming into accelerator? What do we expect to see coming into accelerator? Well, of course, all proposals come into accelerator focus on a market need. The company that is submitting to Accelerator should aim at becoming a global leader, and this should be very clear. I'll be talking more about this to guide you a bit in terms of what we want to see in those projects, but critical, you want to become a global leader, and this is credible. It comes across as credible in your proposition, so you have to believe in it so that we believe in it and the experts, evaluators believe in it. Um, of course, we allow for risk taking. Again, we are EAC, it's a publicly supported vehicle, so we take a lot of risk. But here, mostly the risk is entrepreneurial. There, there could be some technological risk, but most of the risk now is in transitioning into the market already. It could be a scalability of production, it could be a particular aspect of the clinical validation that you have to work on still, and there is a bit of risk there. There will be some risk, but here the private sector is ready to co-invest with you. So the risk is, is controlled, is moderate, because you've been through you know, some validation in transition and the development in Pathfinder. So we assume at this point, private sector can co-invest with us. Limited research in general. For medtech, this is really important because as you know, the, the medtech development cycle is so long that if you do too much research at the level of accelerator, it will be very difficult to finalize a, a C markable device within the accelerator project and then enter the market successfully. Just finally, some, some tips, some bits of advice that if I was at your end, I think would be useful for me. So a good idea is to look at the projects we have funded in the past. They will never be exactly the same, of course, that you're trying to submit, but they will give you a flavor for the kind of team that we request, the, the kind of ambition, what typically has been achieved in the past. So you will be competing with that kind of that kind of projects. Probably the best way to do this, to be honest, is to go to the EAC list of beneficiaries. If you go to our website and you go to the uh, accelerator part, my colleagues um, at uh, Accelerator, they, they submit news items regularly. And if you go now to the, the timeline, to the feed of news, and you sort of scroll back in time, you will see some lists of successful beneficiaries for every cutoff. And that's fantastic. You open that bit of news and you will see the full list of projects we have supported. And that will give you a flavor for what level of maturity, how does the executive team look? Uh, should they be junior, very senior? I can tell you they have to be senior, experienced, the, 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 the market should be clear. Um, but it, it, it's best if you have a look at yourself and then you can compare to your to your idea. You can also work with the NCPs. This is a fantastic idea because the NCPs have a lot of experience and 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 they are in the same business as we are the AC. So making sure you're well guided, you know what we're expecting, and so you use your time efficiently. If you submit something, it should be competitive. So they will help you a lot and they have a lot of experience. Okay, so let's talk about the the topic. So the, the challenge is called decontamination. Um, for pandemic management. Let me tell you a bit about the story behind this topic. Uh, and I will use intensively the text of the call, so I will not deviate from the text that you have. I will just expand it a little bit. So we said the management of infectious diseases propagated by aerosol suspensions, and of course you're thinking COVID, like all of us. Um, so propagated by aerosol suspensions or by direct physical contact with surfaces. 
often has required social distancing. And that's a critical motivation behind this call. I can tell you that this call came out of discussions with HERA, the Health um, Emergency Preparedness Ag Agency that was created in the wake of the, of the COVID situation. And we interacted with them trying to look for ways to help more and more with the problem of COVID and future pandemics. And one of the concepts that came up again and again in the discussions was that we have a vaccine or a set of vaccines as a tool, and the focus will continue, of course, in this prophylactic approach to fighting uh, viral pandemics. This will continue. Uh, we also have, and we're having more and more of therapeutic approaches, uh, like you know, antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, for example. Once the infection is happening, how can we treat it? And that's ongoing work already. But we thought there was a space that was not really fully covered, and that was social distancing. So what we say in the context is social distancing can have a dramatic effect on economies. We've all been through this, precluding air travel, retail activities, office teamwork. Moreover, insufficient social interaction has been a major cause of depression, anxiety, and this has been behind in the background of those peaks in, 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 in mental health situations that we've seen during the pandemic. So we decided to focus on social distancing, technology for to fight social distancing in the context of pandemic. And that's what we said in the, in the context, the creation and commercialization of technologies enabling pandemic resilient behavioral patterns. So we would like to keep the behavioral patterns of humans more or less unchanged as much as possible, even though a wake of uh, a viral um, uh, pandemic is, is ongoing, particularly in poorly ventilated spaces, because that's where the problem typically has occurred. So we want to fight the need for social distancing with technology. That's the main objective of the call. And so because there's been substantial progress um, achieved on innovative barriers for aerosol capture, there are plenty in the literature, many of them developed in Europe, nanostructure and functionalized membranes with tunable properties that can capture those aerosols. Membrane embedded microbial deactivation, for example, enzymatic or metal enabled deactivation of viral load. Um, but there is also a possibility to very accurately model airflow and pathogen circulation in closed spaces. So that gives you an additional tool. You can capture the aerosol. You can also predict to some extent how the aerosol and the pathogen load will propagate in the space. And there's a third element that we have um, in Europe or globally in technology is rapid detection and profiling of pathogens. That has become a reality with PCR, you know, isothermal, uh, LAMP, uh, CRISPR, immunoassays, novel nanomaterials uh, with electrical interaction or luminescent uh, catalytic properties. Um, there are many ways to characterize, profile the pathogen that was present in the aerosol you just captured. So that's another element. So we put together all those technologies and we thought, okay, there's an opportunity for companies in Europe to build systems that decrease the need for social distancing, even if there are future waves of uh, pandemics. Um, so this is what we say in this in this paragraph. These achievements can be brought together to realize full systems and devices capable of continuous air filtering, pathogen capture, deactivation for air purification with sampling and as close as possible or as close as needed real time pathogen detection and profiling. Um, because the, the image we have in our minds is that this system that you will propose to us, to the experts and to the agency, will include the capture of the aerosol, the real-time profiling of what's present, and then with that information, the system, in an intelligent way, will decide whether an alarm needs to be raised, whether the rate of aerosol capture needs to be modified, whether some parameters need to be adjusted in the system. So this profiling can inform your, your future technology to optimize it for the for the given situation in terms of viral load. So the challenge calls for proposals by SMEs with technologies. It's important for us that this must be backed by scientific evidence. So we're talking about accelerator. This is not a pathfinder uh, opportunity. So the science behind it should be 
you know, by far demonstrated already. And, and you're really at the last um, segment of the pipeline. You're trying to finalize a device, maybe complete the assemblage of a system and enter the market with any of these. Very good, I move on. Again, uh, you can see in the slides, I wanted to mention continuously the deadlines that you have ahead. 22nd of March, 7th of June, and 4th of October. And there is a measure there, an estimate for the total funding, 65 million for this challenge. A, a bit more detail about what are the specific objectives. Um, so first, full systems that do high, offer high efficiency aerosol capture with the deactivation, um, air circulation management in closed environments, uh, office space in flight retail stores, uh, including the advanced air filtering architectures and dynamic air circulation optimization. We also include in the call a new generation of face mask technologies because you could imagine that a future face mask with additional features compared to what we have today could also facilitate the reduction of the need for social distancing. So this is included and to give you more flexibility. It doesn't have to be necessarily a system that is installed in, in the context of a building. It could be a face mask or it could be a combination or it could be something in the wind. Um, the next generation face mask technologies with the smart filtration materials to exceed N95 performance at low, low airflow resistance with improved retention and rejection of some micron particles. Um, in a nutshell, just a new generation of face masks that makes our lives more livable, decreasing, uh, decreasing social distancing. Um, and finally, we also wanted to include surface decontamination because we are aware that there are companies in, in Europe that use technologies such as, as an example, UV light, but there could be other options to decontaminate surface. Um, so this combination of new technologies at the mask level, surface decontamination and airflow filtering uh, and characterization in real time, we think there could be a, you know, a good return for society if we get some technologies into the market. Yes, uh, in general, the proposal should um, provide preliminary evidence uh, demonstrating essentially that uh, the technology works, that social distancing can be avoided but substantially reduced under realistic pathogen infectivity assumptions. This is important. So if your work has been very research focused and you have some preliminary ideas about how this could become a product and the context in the lab in which the preliminary data you have makes you think this could be an accelerator, maybe it's a bit too far, uh, you would need to do multiple stages in validating that, you know, in a realistic context, that bench um, technology could work. So you need to gauge very carefully how close you are to the market. Maybe you can guide yourself a little bit looking at the previous uh, beneficiaries to sort of get a sense of maturity in the product. Um, that will set the level of competition you will be facing. I've mentioned this already. Uh, I'm reaching to the end of my, my slide deck. Uh, you've probably heard about the different modalities uh, within this challenge, within Accelerator. Uh, just a brief reminder. Um, remember that there is an investment part and a grant part in our contribution, our support. Uh, typically, the investment part has a maximum of 50 million, and this is an equity investment. So we take an equity position, we take a minority stake in your company. It's just a minority stake. And as my colleagues can, can add to this or, or or confirm, our position is always pro-entrepreneur. We want to co-invest with the private sector, but we are happy to have um, other private investors lead the round. This is not a problem. And, and you will see that we are sort of risk takers and pro-entrepreneur kind of investors. Again, minority stake always. Um, so that's for the investment component. And then for the grant, uh, it's typically a maximum of 2.5 million euros grant. Um, and the time of ex execution for the innovation part, um, it's typically 24 months. That's what we are uh, looking into for the grant part. So again, you can request 2.5 million as a grant, non-dilutive, 
and up to 15 million equity investment. And that's essentially it. Again, you have here the, the, the QRs uh, to find the EAC work program and the recording for the info days. Um, well, I suppose uh, we should have the 2nd of December here, but um, you will have the recordings there. And the QR for the national contact points. Again, this is a, a huge resource. Uh, they have a lot of experience. They can guide you. They can save you a lot of time. Please do talk to your NCPs. And we also have a, a fluid communication with them. So, so if there is something important uh, that they need to communicate with us, this is this is possible. Uh, the NCPs will will get in touch with us. And that's it. Um, thank you so much. Um, let me stop the sharing the presentation. And maybe we should go to the Q and A. Very good. Um, shall I read it? Maybe shall I read the questions? Will you see the market developing in medical technologies and medical devices? OK, um, so the, the discussion today was mostly about one specific niche in those opportunities. Uh, it was really the decontamination opportunity. Uh, we do think there is a lot of market potential. It's true that the, the the pandemic is going waves, as, as we've all learned. And maybe down, now there is a perception that we are in a good phase, down phase. But our colleagues at HERA, ourselves, I think there is a general perception in society that at some point this will reoccur. Hopefully it will be in decades or maybe centuries, but maybe it will be next year. And so we've learned the lesson and, and HERA wants to be prepared. We want to be prepared at EAC. So I think there is a great opportunity for industry and, and for the citizen to get these devices finalized and implemented. So at least this is what I wanted to mention about this particular trend rather than opening up the discussion to other topics. Is the accelerator, I'm sorry. Okay, which is the best way to demonstrate the TRL of your proposal? Well, I can, I can make some comments here. Maybe colleagues also step in if you like. I think typically it's common sense. Uh, Please deal with the process as if you were approaching a venture capitalist or, or a bunch of VCs. What will, you, what will you show them to demonstrate that you are at the right moment in the history of your company? You might want to show the product. Um, if there are users, users already using it, that's always fantastic. If they are paying users, that's twice as fantastic, of course, because that validates it's done it's working and they want to pay for it. And you can demonstrate that your estimate of the price point is realistic. Is that, I think it's just common sense. Uh, try to approach Accelerator as if we were VCs and you, you will actually find VCs in the, in the jury when you get to the jury interview. So, so approach it that way. Yes, I think it's you can you can submit the short version anytime, right, colleagues? Can you please confirm this? Yes, this short proposal can be submitted anytime in the in the year uh, for the full proposals. Uh, so the uh, cut off dates deadlines are three remaining for 2023, 22nd of March, 7th of June, and 4th of October. This is important to re uh, remind also that there open to sorry there <laughs> these cutoffs are uh, both for open and challenges so um, we don't make any distinction all the three cutoffs will serve open and challenges proposals thank you Vani. so they can submit the short proposal at any time yes but they need to submit they will need to prepare the full proposal before and submit the full proposal before the deadline so they need to exactly get the short proposal yes the show proposal time. is submitted any time and then in approximately four weeks it is evaluated and then from that moment onwards uh, they can start preparing a full proposal for the full proposal it works like uh, with normal deadlines uh, so the three i just said uh, march 22 june 7 october 4. very good thanks so much Ivani. okay i think the accelerator program is now open to uk 
companies, right? Could your colleagues um, help me out with this one? I think at the moment there is no agreement with the UK, right? What's the situation? So the situation is that UK companies can apply only for a grant. So no blended funding option possible at all. And I'm afraid for the person who asked the question, the fact that the startup is planning to serve the EU countries is not, uh, let's say, we cannot make any uh, exception on this. Uh, this is not, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a benefit. That So um, grant only, but subject to the signature of the agreement with the um, with the UK, which is still pending at the moment. Okay. So even if they are planning for the grant, it's not confirmed at this point, right? That exactly. they will. Okay. Thank you. It's very clear. Thank you. Will the interview jury members of this specific topic call have a medtech background, only business finance? I think there will be a mix. Many of the jury members have a background in in venture capital investment, but most of them have some background in investment in, in medical technologies. Um, this is kind of done on purpose in a way because when you try to raise the private side of the round, you will be mostly facing VCs and in Europe, many of them have a, a finance kind of background. Um, and this, you, you will encounter members in the, in the jury team who have some expertise that might be really, really into the same segment, but typically they will be generalists uh, in the investment community, but within medical area, but generalists. How to deal with the 30% that is not funded? Is use of the equity possible? What are possible options if we don't have that amount on our account? Yeah, I believe you can You can use this. Please, uh, Giovanni. Uh, or, I can take yes, this, this one. Yeah, I confirm that for the planned projects, the use of equity is, is possible to cover those 30 percent. For uh, grant only and grant first uh, projects, uh, the beneficiaries uh, have to find uh, another way to to cover this amount. So we cannot help with that. Very good. Very clear, Justina. Thank you. Are my chances for receiving funding higher through the open or the challenge based call? Not sure if our company is totally in scope with your challenge. But it's a good question that comes up often. So in the challenge, you only compete to other companies that have, you know, the same challenge in mind, which typically tends to be a smaller subset of European companies. On the other hand, the funding amount is a smaller too. So it's difficult to answer the question. I think if you anticipate that you, that you don't really have the focus that's needed for the challenge, maybe that sort of answers the question for you. If you think the focus is enough, I would I would think you have higher chance if you go to a challenge because then you're restricted in the time of in terms of competitors. But it's difficult to anticipate, to be honest. It's very difficult to anticipate. If I can just add, of course. Onto that. And so yeah, just based on our experience in, in the last uh, year or so, we, we've had kind of maybe less focused challenges. We have kind of a larger amount of, of uh, of, of uh, applicants to us and in terms of success rate it is more or less the same but as we say this year it's, it's kind of a, it's a different story so it's hard to, to really kind of give a, a a clear answer on this it's it's a bit of a, a new experience for us having having this uh, many challenges so um yeah it's it'd be hard to to give such a, a kind of a, a you know a prediction at this stage so um yeah, it's uh, just to, to make sure everyone's aware. It, we, we don't really have a kind of a, a background on this particular type of success rate. Thanks, thanks so much. This is really useful. So, until now, so Neil is explaining to us that we've seen similar success rate, but it's difficult to predict what will happen in the future. That that's useful. Thanks so much. Neil. What would you consider a TRL six? Colleagues, who steps in with your perception of TRL six? What's TRL six for you? Who comes in? Oh, we leave it to you, Enric. <laughs> so for Accelerator, typically you have to have a device that has demonstrated that it works, the core technology works. It has been proven in a setup that's very close to the final use in the market. And that gives the investors in the jury team and the experts the feeling that the next stage is a scaling production and entering the market. 
typically that's what I would expect to see. If you have a preliminary test, preliminary test in the lab only at the bench level, that probably doesn't feel close enough to market. There are multiple stages still. If your device, your system has multiple modules and does mo those modules say aerosol capture, characterization of the pathogen, simulation of the flow, if those modules are disconnected, but individually in the right setup, they work, I would think the experts could think, right, the integration is not so hard, this could work out. If the individual models need a lot of research still, I think this would be out for accelerator. That, that's my take. Again, it's always a bit unpredictable because it's the, the experts have their vision of the path you have ahead, um, but this is my feeling if that helps. Is EAC collaborating with medical authorities, authorization bodies? If so, how and, and, and how as a possible funding winner could benefit from that? Yes, so we're doing several things. Um, we are preparing a webinar on CE marking because that's always one of the issues in, in the medical technology industry at this moment. You know, we've migrated from the MDD the directive to the regulation to the MDR. And this has been a struggle for the, for the industry. And many of our companies are struggling with MDR. So we're trying to help them. We prepared um, a simple guide that explains CA marking, and we are running a webinar. And we will have um, on our platform, there is the EAC platform, where you will be able to submit some questions about CA marking. And for a period of time after that webinar, we will have some experts uh, listening to your questions, reading your questions, and providing some answers. They cannot go really, really deep but they can give you some guidance. So that's, in terms of C marketing, something we are implementing already. So you will benefit from that for sure. Uh, I don't think there will be a, a connection with EMA, the European Medicines Agency, but just for you to know, just in case, uh, we just ran a workshop with them and there's a very strong connection with EMA regarding uh, services they are providing to early stage companies so that you can understand if there are any regulations that involve EMA and prepare for those. So we are working in both directions and you will benefit from both flows of information, both at the CA marking level and also at the EMA level. Is the call specific for a pandemic situation or something more general regarding perhaps antimicrobial resistance? Well, this could be an element. I mean, this could be an element of novelty. If you rationalize that there is a market opportunity to measure or filter out not just pathogens related to the pandemic situation, but beyond that, and particularly with emphasis on microbial resistance, why not? This could be an element of novelty. This could be added value to your product in the market. Why not? So the call is triggered by the pandemic situation, but HERA and EAC and everybody at the Commission is really eager to expand the features of your technology. So if you can cover current pandemic situation plus elements of antimicrobial resistance, okay, that, that sounds fantastic. So it's not restrictive really, it's, it's quite broad. How can a market need to be stated for a critical unknown time frame event? Yeah, this is a very good point. I think with all assessments of market need, it is very difficult. Usually companies that seem to be successful, they look at examples in the marketplace. If you know of examples of companies in a similar segment who have been successful in entering the market, even though there is a lot of unknowns in the future market need, that's a good point. You could also look at beyond, you could, you could go back in history and say, look, these are the pandemic events we've seen in history, or this is what the experts say about the next possible waves in the context of COVID. Um, but again, like one of your colleagues was asking, you could extend that to other areas where pathogens are involved and we're having clean air and um, profiling of the present pathogens could be relevant beyond COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, still, the perception is that even if the, 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 the peak of the situation is, is claimed to have finished, there will be market interest and you can of course expand it to other areas. So it's difficult to anticipate, but I would use, I would use examples and I would look back into history. What kind of scientific evidence for effectiveness of a filter system is required? Well, I would go to the standard um, 
you know, harmonize the standards. And I would try to use those to prove that your technology is at the level sufficient for safe indoors operation. If you're focusing on a mask, it's probably easier in a way because there's a lot more you can, you can compare with. If you're talking about um, air filtering, aerosol capture and profiling, it might be a bit, a bit harder, but I would use the standards you will find in the industry to see which viral load uh, should be acceptable, which practic which particle size, for example, and I would compare to the standards. You can also take, again, products already in the market that have some similarities and compare those and say, look, our products can do the same as this one. And in addition to that, we have the real-time profiling of the pathogen, or we have the modeling of the airflow, or we can go to volumes of a space much larger than we've seen in the state of the art. I would compare to existing products in the market if that's possible. With enclosed space demonstration, is a large airline or equivalent needed as validation route in the proposal? Yeah, I cannot give you the exact answer because it will depend on what the experts or the jury members will think. I, I can give you my common sense. And common sense is you probably need to test the system in a context that's quite similar to the context in which it will be used in the market. That probably makes sense. If you haven't done it in the same volume, for example, you could rationalize, look, I haven't done it because I had this practical issue. Maybe I needed the support of the EAC and the private investors to go to the next stage. And if it makes sense, in my mind, that, that will make sense. They couldn't test it in that context because they couldn't get to that level of experimentation. But you have to rationalize it. And there's, of course, a risk. If you haven't tested the system in the right, lo right location, for example, in the right workflow, in an airline, for example, sort of, context, then the risk is higher. And I think it will be perceived by the jury members, but that's okay if you rationalize it. So remember you're competing with similar projects. So you might all run into the same limitations. You just, you have to make the project solid, very credible. Okay. So that's the end of the- One more question. Oh, yes. How important is the price of the product in the call? It's hard to estimate the price of a mass produced product. It isn't in that production phase yet. Yes, of course. This is in general true for, for most products and you can estimate that as you scale the production, the cost will go down. I think you have to do a few estimates. Um, and then also you have to have the cost benefit factor in your equation. So it might not just be the absolute price, but the, the impact in the healthcare system, for example, how do you plan to bring this to market? Maybe your future buyer could be an airline, but it could be uh, the healthcare. Uh, and then it goes beyond pricing or the immediate price of the product. It, it, it goes beyond that. It, the impact is how will this impact the healthcare system? How will the pressure on the healthcare system decrease if your system works? Um, but it's true, it's difficult to estimate the final price. I think it's a general situation in early stage tech companies. Uh, you can provide various pricing uh, over time. You can estimate how the price will decrease as you scale production, for example. And you need to rationalize again, this price is good enough, the advantage, the benefits will you know, offset the cost, at least in terms of perception of the customer. But you have to do an estimate and try to back that with as much evidence as you can. But it's a difficult, it's difficult for the companies. Yeah. Okay. There are no other questions. Good. Thanks so much, everyone. We can wrap up. Yes. And Marie is there. Do you want to wrap up? I'll wrap up. Uh, oh, so thanks, well, everyone. I'm there. Oh, there you are. OK. Sorry. Um, thank you, everybody, for the many questions that you have, uh, that you raised. Thank you, Enrique, for the good explanation. And uh, then I just want to say that in 15 minutes time, we will start with uh, the second part of the medical technologies challenges. And that is dedicated to full scale micro nano bio devices for medical and medical research applications. And it will again be with Enrique and it will be about the transition topic. So maybe we see you there. And otherwise, good luck with your uh, application for the accelerator topic.
Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks so much, colleagues as well, for your help. Thank you.